Well, thank you, Stina, for that very kind introduction and for the conveners uh, for inviting me and all of you for staying here to listen to me. I'm supposed to say something mind-expanding, unsettling and subversive, and now also disturbing about gender. And if that wasn't I aiming too high, I'll add about the cultural politics in which we are currently practicing feminist resistance and addressing res resistance to feminism. Now, I intend to do that through focusing on a feeling that I believe is of some importance to resistance to feminism and feminist resistance in Nordic cultures today, which is the feeling of loss. Loss is, of course, an inevitable part of living, learning, and also aging, but there are many ways to make sense of it. And my tentative and very simple suggestion, which I hope you will consider with me, is that the feeling of loss uh, has been recru recruited to some troubling structures of feeling in Nordic cultures, which it is important to work through to be able to address, address both racism and sexism in this context. Now, to consider this, I will return to a deeply unsettling point in time, which is the days and weeks after the terrorist attack in Oslo and Utøya on the 22nd of July, 2011. Now, I forgot to take the pointer. So, on the afternoon of July 22nd, a bomb blew in the middle of the government terror, and with that interpretation, the responsibility was the established racial economy of terror. In that afternoon, before it was known what really happened, the Norwegian Center Against Racism has documented widespread racist harassment and violence against Norwegians of color uh, who uh, were targeted by people who held them responsible somehow for what had happened. These perpetrators of harassment and violence were ready to hold any Muslim or person of color resp responsible for the attack in those hours. Now, as you know, these concerns about racism were seemingly rendered obsolete uh, on that day because of the events that unfolded that evening. As the night fell, it became clear that the terrorist was an ethnic Norwegian man. And from that term, the public would learn that he was Norwegian born, white, with Norwegian as his first language, and most likely also a secular Christian. This piece of information changed the public into understanding of the event dramatically, and suddenly the premediation of the terror attack as an al-Qaeda terror was exposed as mere prejudice, and there was no established conceptual framework to rely on anymore. Philosopher Leon Aristas pointed out that when it was discovered that the perpetrator was a blonde white man, as Norwegian as any, the majority was faced with an, an identity problem to follow the recipe of understanding terror as an outcome of cultural aggression after the uh, fact of the terrorist uh, ethnicity was known would have, have amounted to painful self-examination. Now, 77 people were murdered by Anders Bering Breivik over three years ago, and it's not within my capacity to, re to relate the horror of what happened on that day. But I think the thoughts about loss that were voiced in the immediate aftermath of the attack can teach us something about the cultural conditions for feminism and anti-racism in Nordic societies today. At that time, a number of fiction authors, include, including figures like Jon Espe, who I will focus on today, Karl Ove Knausgård, Cornelius Jochen and Jan Kjærstad, to name a few, tried to address a profound feeling of loss and disorientation in Norwegian newspapers. These authors tried to make sense not only of what was lost in the attack, the lives, but also of the cultural conditions of that loss. The personal was not only personal, was national. Their texts were dense with affect, 
in the sense that they were marked by a rawness of experience that <clears throat> is not explicable or understandable in available frames of understanding, to borrow a definition from Stephen Frosch. Now, in between losing a loved one and mourning that loss, um, Sigmund Freud, which we can think about as a part of history here now, suggested that there is a time when uh, mourning is in a sense scattered because we have, uh, we have yet to, to realize the loss. In Mourning and Melancholia, Freud noted, noted that mourning is commonly the reaction to a loss of a beloved person or an abstraction taking the place of that person, such as a fatherland, freedom, an ideal, and so on. Now, the and so on is a crucial part of this uh, definition because it suggests that the lost uh, object could be anything at all, including an object, object constru constructed in fantasy. Through my work with uh, the text of Norwegian fiction authors in newspapers after J July 22nd, it became evident that the horrible loss of lives on that day was interpreted through the lens of yet other losses of an ideal of the happy moment of Nordic social democracies that becomes all the more happy in the childhood memories that it is sh shrouded in in these texts. Jul Nesbø's text in Norway, The Past is a for a Foreign Country, which I will read to you here today, was published on July 26th, only a few days after. Nesbø uh, is represented in Norway as a multi-talented footballer, musician, and author of author children's literature, as well as an internationally famous author of crime fiction. He has sold over two million books in Norway, and every fifth household in the country owns his latest uh, novel about the detective Hari Hule. Nesby rarely publishes social commentary uh, in Norway, and, it, and his piece appeared first in the New York Times and then later in Norway. Um, I, I've chosen this text because it's not seen as a controversial text. It is rather centrist, I would say, or we perceived at that, uh, as that at the time. Um, and I believe that it reflects something that we need to call a mainstream sent uh, sentiment about Nordic social democratic culture. So I'll read it to you now, all of it, uh, as an anchor for our thinking about the feeling of loss, race, and gender uh, in Nordic countries today. So here we go with the past as a foreign country, and we'll have that nice. A few days ago, he writes, before the bombing here and the, uh, the shootings on the Utah Island, a friend and I were walking about, uh, about uh, talking about how the joy of being alive always seems to go hand in hand with the sorrows of how things change. Not even the brightest future can make up for the fact that no re roads lead back to what came before, to the innocence of childhood or the first time we fell in love. There is no road back to the scent of the Julys when I was young and leapt from a boulder into, ice cold, into the ice-cold meltwater of a Norwegian fjord. No road back to when I stood 17 years old with 10 francs in my pocket by the harbor in Cannes, France, and watched two grown men in idiotic white uniforms row a woman and uh, her poodle ashore from a yacht. I realized then for the first time that the egalitarian society I came from was the exception and not the rule. No road back to the first time I looked wide-eyed at the guards with automatic weapons surrounding another country's parliament building, a sight that, a sight that made me shake my head with a mixture of resignation and self-satisfaction, thinking we don't need that sort of thing where I come from. Many, for many years, it seems, seemed as if nothing changed in, Nor in Norway. You could leave the country for three months, travel the world through coups d'etats, assassinations, famines, massacres, and tsunamis, and come home to find that the only thing in the newspapers that was new was the crossword puzzle. It was a country where everyone's material needs were provided for. Political consensus was overwhelming. The debates focused primarily on how to achieve the goals that everyone had already agreed on. Ideological disagreements arose only when the reality of the rest of the world began to encroach. 
when a nation that until the 1970s had consisted of largely people of the same ethnic and cultural background had to decide whether its new citizens should be allowed to wear the hijab and build mosques. Still, until Friday, we thought of our country as a virgin, unsullied by the ills of society. An exaggeration, of course, and yet. In June, I was bicycling with the Norwegian Prime Minister, Jens Stoltenberg, and a mutual friend through Oslo, setting out for a hike on a forested mountain slope in this big yet little city. Two bodyguards followed us also on bicycles as we stopped at an intersection for a red light. Uh, and then a car drove up beside the Prime Minister. The driver called out through the open window, Jens, there's a little boy here who thinks it would be cool to say hello to you. The Prime Minister smiled and shook hands with the little boy in the passenger seat. Hello, I'm Jens. The Prime Minister wearing his bike helmet, the boy wearing his seatbelt, both of them stopped for a red light. The bodyguards had stopped at a discreet distance behind, smiling. It is an image of safety and mutual trust, of the ordinary, idyllic society that we all took for granted. How could anything go wrong? We had bike helmets and seat belts, and we were obey obeying the traffic rules. Well, of course, something could go wrong. Something can always go wrong.